Okay, I am Debbie Palm, a member of the Christian Science Church in Beaverton, and we are sponsoring this talk tonight. And the talk is on Christian Science Healing, Praying with Certainty, and it's being given by Kevin Gronke. He spent over 16 years in the field of advertising and corporate communications, where he was honored by the Business Marketing Association as a certified business communicator. <laughs> Today, he serves his local community through his healing practice, teaching, and branch church work. He also writes for the Christian Science Journal and Sentinel, and has been interviewed on the Sentinel Radio and Spirituality.com. Mm -hmm. And so this is all true so far? So okay, far, so good. good. <laughs> <laughs> and as a member of the Christian Science Board of Lectureship, Kevin has spoken to diverse public audiences, interfaith groups, comparative religion classes, correctional facilities, and on college and university campuses. As a Christian science practitioner and teacher of Christian science healing, he is committed to helping people find renewed health and lasting answers to problems through the practical system of healing presented in Mary Baker Eddy's book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. So please join me in welcoming Kevin Gronke. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Glad to have you. Well done. Well, thank you for that sunny Oregon welcome. <laughs> it's lovely to be here. What a great setting for our lecture tonight. Hats off to those who made this arrangement and just a wonderful acknowledgement of gratitude to the school for making this available. So it's great. It's great. Thank you. Well, let me start tonight by asking a, a, a very simple question, maybe deceptively simple. <laughs> Does anyone here tonight feel that life is pretty much the same as it was maybe 6 or 12 or 24 months ago? Not so much. No, not so much at all. I think it's fair to say that most of us today are thinking much more carefully about lots of things. We're thinking about our health our security, the economy at, at many different levels, local as well as national and global. I read a piece in last weekend's um, uh, Statesman Journal. The head of Oregon's Health Policy Board wrote an opinion piece in which he said that between 30 and 40 percent of health care costs here come from waste and inefficiency. And he concluded in his piece that the, the human and the financial cost of this waste really is too high. It's unacceptable. One other piece that I've been sharing as I've given this talk around uh, the country, the Gallup organization found not long ago that about 34% of Americans, about one in three, now say that the most urgent health problem that's facing our country is access to health care. And yet, 76% of the respondents in that same study said they're dissatisfied with the cost of health care. So definitely some correlation between the waste that's being seen here and Americans in general thinking that health care costs too much. What do these reports signal for us? There's an implication here. And I think that since this issue of health and health care just seems to loom over everything, we need to consider what is being said here. As we look deeper, these kinds of reports can signify one thing, and that is that they're, they're pointing to an underlying assumption. And the assumption is that health is essentially a commodity. It's something to be purchased, and prescribed to be insured and micromanaged all by someone other than ourselves. But I also find that within these reports, there's, there's something else going on. There's a need to upgrade this whole question of health. We need a makeover in the whole view of individual as well as economic health. One that's not just more hopeful, but one that's firmly based on a deeper spiritual foundation, one that's more certain, and one that looks at health from a completely spiritual perspective. Now, 
We all like upgrades. I like to ride up front in the airplanes when I get those upgrades. You probably do too. So if we're going to upgrade this question of health and health care, how can we start to do that? Well, let me share with you perhaps a little illustration that might get that discussion going. A little paperweight here. It's a little globe in there. Now, if I come out here and hold it up and let it go, what's going to happen? It's going to drop. Now, that's remarkable because no one in the audience tonight has ever actually seen me do this. And yet, you're certain of the outcome. Why? Law of gravity. And your past experience with the law of gravity says that if I do that over and over again, the outcome is certain and it will be the same. What makes us certain of the paperweight dropping is a law that applies to everyone everywhere around the world, whether you live in Portland or Portugal or anywhere in between. And it's a law that's just as certain if you're just holding down some papers on a desktop or if you're studying astronomy or quantum physics. The law is the same. So then we ask, all right, we've identified a law. Is it possible to have that same sense of certain law as it relates to health? A universal law that truly defines health as a basic right for everyone, a standard of living that's designed and defined by an infinitely higher power? Well, the answer is yes, and this is what we're going to be looking at together tonight. This law, this tangible, all-powerful law of goodness and spirituality that's at work in the lives of everyone everywhere around the world. This law comes from a divine source, not a human one. Now that term divine source can mean lots of different things to lots of different people. But just to be clear and to keep it in the context of what we're sharing together tonight, when I use that term, I am referring to God, to the supreme being, the infinite designer and creator of the universe, the one whom the Bible describes this way in the contemporary English version, says, you, Lord, are the light that keeps me safe. I am not afraid of anyone. You protect me, and I have no fears. You keep me safe on top of a mighty rock. Well, this divine source, this light, this God who is all good, takes us way beyond clinical research and universal health insurance. And instead, it shows us that there is, in fact, lasting hope and real assurance because there is a loving God who cares for us. He always has, he is now, and always will. And this is what Jesus Christ proved in his healing and teaching ministry. He taught and healed on the basis of divine law. And we find in Mark's Gospel of how a woman who has suffered from a hemorrhaging condition for 12 years and has spent all of her life savings trying to find a cure isn't getting anywhere. Mark tells us she has spent all her money. She's not getting better, she's getting worse. But she hears that Jesus is coming to the city where she lives. And so there's an intuition that if she can just get close enough to him to just touch the border of his garment, she'll be healed. And so she sets off from home. She makes her way through the crowd that has formed. And she does get just close enough to Jesus. She touches the border of his garment. And she's cured. Now, there's another time, another scenario, where the outcome was much less certain than that. Jesus' disciples have tried to heal a little boy who's been having seizures all of his life. The disciples are not successful. They are not able to bring about the cure that the boy's father is so desiring. 
And so Matthew's gospel tells how when the, the disciples are not able to cure the little boy, the father takes him to Jesus. And just as with the woman with the hemorrhage, the little boy is healed within moments. Now, put yourself in the disciples' sandals for a moment or two. You can almost hear the reporter saying, how do you feel about that? <laughs> they've been following Jesus. They've been listening to his ministry. They've been preaching the good news of the gospel, the kingdom of God within. And yet now they've had a case that they were not able to cure. And so they come to Jesus privately and they ask him, why couldn't we do this? And their master uses it as a teachable moment. He says, first off, because of your unbelief. But he doesn't leave it there because that wouldn't have been a teachable moment. That would have just been a scolding moment. And he says that this kind of healing requires three things. Faith, prayer, and fasting. And it is this statement, a statement that we might refer to or think about as Christ's three foundation stones for healing. This is what we're going to look at in depth tonight. And these three foundation stones, as we will see, form the basis of this divine law of good. They're the basis on which Jesus built his healing ministry, and they're the same basis on which you and I can build ours as well. Faith, prayer, and fasting. Now, I'm going to ask you to think along with me. This is the uh, one of three audience participation parts tonight. When you hear people describing faith today, what words are they using? How are people talking about faith today? What is it? Belief? Belief? Sure. Belief. Trust. Confidence. That's a strong sense of faith, but confidence, sure. What else? I'm sorry? It's, uh, but, you know, faith just in general. You know, you, you have faith that probably tomorrow it's going to rain again in Portland. <laughs> but believe, that's not faith, that's a rule, huh? <laughs> what about expectancy? Would you agree that expectancy is a component of faith? I would. That we expect something. What else? Hope. Sure. Any others? Spirituality. Spirituality, sure. All right. Focus. That's a good one. I like that. Okay. Uh, understanding. Okay. This is good. I'm going to abbreviate that. And now let's take a look together at this word, this amazing word, faith, that Jesus uses here. In Matthew's Gospel, the contemporary English Bible says it this way, Jesus speaking to his disciples. He says, I can promise you this. If you had faith no larger than a mustard seed, you could tell this mountain to move from here to there, and it would. Everything would be possible to you. So let's think about that. What kind of faith can move mountains? Well, the Greek word that Jesus uses here for faith is piste, and it means conviction of truth. In other words, being convinced of the truthfulness of God. It also means assurance and fidelity. And so, as someone said, it also refers to confidence, for Jesus, faith meant confident, unwavering reliance upon God's unfailing love for all of humanity. And when the woman with the hemorrhage is healed, what does he say to her? He says, daughter. What a beautiful expression of love. Daughter, you are now well because of your faith. May God give you peace you are healed, you will no longer be in pain. 
Also, in the scriptures, in the New Testament, we have in Hebrews chapter 11, a beautiful and brilliant discourse on faith. The Amplified Bible puts part of it this way. It says, now faith is the assurance, the confirmation of the things we hope for. It is the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality. So we're seeing this word conviction coming out in several different ways. And Hebrews also adds this. It says, faith perceives as real fact what is not revealed to the human senses. So faith then isn't just a blind hope that things might get better somehow, somewhere, someplace down the road. Faith is the evident perception of present spiritual fact. It's the intelligent conviction that comes from knowing, not just wishing, that God is at work in our lives right here, right now. And so it is then our abiding confidence in God, the expectation of his love. That's what we do know. That's what we do feel. And it is that confidence and expectation of God's love that moves the mountains of doubt, levels, raises up the valleys of worry, and replaces the barrenness of a life that can seem to be left without hope. Whether one has uh, friends or knows of someone who may be homeless or going through a divorce or suffering from abuse or neglect, faith lifts that up. It's faith that trusts because it understands and understands because it trusts. Now in the other book we're going to be considering tonight along with the scriptures is Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures written by Mary Baker Eddy who is the discoverer and founder of Christian Science. And in this book Mrs. Eddy presents the most meaningful and spiritually practical description of how to heal through prayer that the world has ever known. And as the textbook of Christian science, it explains how you and I can heal quickly, effectively, and with certainty, building upon these three foundation stones of faith, prayer, and fasting. Now, out in the hallway as you came in, you probably saw a lovely long table with copies of Science and Health. The covers are a little different than this, but the inside is still the same. It's just an earlier printing. I encourage you on your way out to pick up a copy of Science and Health. In fact, don't just take one. Take two, one for yourself and one to share with a friend, a neighbor, a coworker who's looking for that same sense of certainty in their healing. And as you're reading it for the first time, you may not even want to start at the very front of the book. You may want to start on page 600. Why page 600? That's the beginning of a chapter called Fruitage, in which people who have read and prayed with the ideas in science and health have been healed with amazing certainty of all sorts of physical challenges, financial problems, broken homes, divorce, the death in the family, and how they have prayed that through and have found healing in this book. Now, the copies of Science and Health tonight are complimentary. There are some other books and literature out on the table, and for a modest cost, cost you can talk to the people that are going to be at the table afterwards and maybe take something else home with you as well. So that's the word from our sponsor. Now, I am going to start, for the purpose of our discussion tonight, on the very first page of Science and Health because it's relevant to what we're discussing. It says here that the prayer that reforms the sinner and heals the sick is an absolute faith that all things are possible to God, a spiritual understanding of him, an unselfed love. You hear how Mary Baker Eddy is elevating this concept of faith just as you did. Spiritual understanding, unselfed love. 
and referring, in fact, to what Jesus had said, everything will be possible to you. And this applies not to just a few of us here tonight. It applies to everyone in this auditorium, in this city, in the world. Mary Baker Eddy is reminding us here that nothing is impossible to God and so consistent with Jesus' teaching and that faith and prayer are not abstract concepts. They are something to live. They are something to live by, not theoretical. And Mrs. Eddy found that true Christian healing, the kind that Jesus did, it comes from gaining a better understanding of our real spiritual identity, seeing ourselves the way God sees us. This is a transforming spiritual view that goes way beyond physicality, goes way beyond mortal limitation. This is the view that Jesus lived by and it is the view that he brought to the world for all time. And this is how science and health describes that view and what Jesus did. Mrs. Eddy writes that the divine nature was best expressed in Christ Jesus, who did what? Who threw upon mortals the truer reflection of God and lifted their lives higher than their poor thought models would allow. Thoughts which presented man as fallen, sick, sinning, dying. <laughs> kind of sounds like the six o'clock news, doesn't it? <laughs> she goes on, the Christ-like understanding of scientific being and divine healing includes a perfect principle and idea. Perfect God and perfect man as the basis, the foundation of thought and demonstration. Now, as someone who studied Jesus' words and works from childhood, Mary Baker Eddy realized that to gain this higher, truer sense of reflection, this Christ-like understanding of perfect God and perfect man, we also need to know what Scripture says about these poor thought models of evil and its effects. And so, for example, she found Jesus not only identifying evil as, quote, a liar and the father of all lies and of all that is false, but also found Jesus prophesying in the Gospel of John that both lie and liar, what he called the ruler of this world, would be cast out, permanently expelled, not just swept quietly under the carpet for a while, permanently expelled. And what would we discover in place of that? We would discover the light of truth, of life, and of love, which Jesus describes this way, again, from the Amplified Bible, from John's Gospel, saying, while you have the light, believe in the light. Have faith in it. Hold to it. Rely upon it. And so Christian science healing then gains its certainty from the scriptural fact as Jesus showed that God's kingdom, his dominion, his supreme control over all is never opposed. It's never obstructed. Now, that's more than just a helpful fact to know. It's something that we can make use of in our daily lives. And what can we do with it? Science and Health says that at all times and under all circumstances, overcome evil with good. Know thyself and God will supply the wisdom and the occasion for a victory over evil. Not for a prolonged struggle with evil, not for a fist fight with evil, but for a victory over it. And you know, as you look at this page, there are no disclaimers, there are no footnotes that say, well, you know, that victory might take a while, and maybe might not come to you. There's none of that there. It is a universal declaration to know yourself, and God will give you 
the wisdom <clears throat> and the occasion for a victory over evil. How could Mary Baker Eddy make such a statement? Well, it was life itself that led her to pray and study the Bible often, especially when she needed a victory over the evils of chronic illness and personal loss, including the untimely deaths of her first husband, George Glover, and very shortly after that of her favorite brother, Albert. But in spite of that sort of heartbreak, in spite of her own frequent illnesses as she was growing up from a girl to a young woman, she mostly avoided the harsh treatments of 19th century conventional medicine and its very, very unfortunate side effects. She felt sure that there had to be another, more certain way to be healthy. She looked into a number of alternatives to health. Today, alternative medicine still makes the news. And one of the ones that she looked at is one that's still being looked at today, homeopathy. She became intrigued with homeopathy and its emphasis on diluting the drug in a, in a pill to the point where it had all but disappeared from the remedy. And in fact, for a while, she did do some research and experimentation with placebos, completely unmedicated pellets. And she found <laughs> that the people who took the placebos got better. Well, this study led her to an important conclusion. And that conclusion was that the, the only real benefit that lay in those remedies came from what? The patient's faith in them. More to the point, she concluded that true and lasting healing comes, as she wrote, through the consciousness which God bestows. Well, a significant turning point came in her research and in her life in the winter of 1866. She was out with some friends. She slipped and fell. She was severely injured. Her friends carried her to a nearby home and summoned the local doctor. He came and examined her. And his notes said that she was in critical condition. She had sustained a concussion, internal injuries, and had very likely dislocated her spine. Well, over the next few days, as she lay immobile in bed, she glimpsed that there had to be a certain answer for her in this hour of extreme fear, of extreme need and pain. She recalled her lifelong Bible study. And so in faith and in trust and with great expectancy, she asked someone in the house to bring her a copy of the Bible. She opened it and she read the account of two of Jesus' healings. One of them was Matthew's record of Jesus healing the paralyzed man who had been confined to his bed. And Jesus' words in the gospel, arise and walk, spoke to her with tremendous certainty and infinite power. She rose, she walked, she was healed. Now from this experience then going forward, Mary Baker Eddy's own faith and confidence really began to grow and to blossom. Did that mean that she was never again going to have crises or setbacks in her life? No, it didn't mean that at all. What it did mean though is that when they came, she was ready to meet them with spiritual strength and conviction when she had the wisdom and the occasion for a victory over evil. It was this healing, though, which she described as the moment when she discovered Christian science that led her into nine years of intensive and consecutive study of the Bible and also of teaching others what she was beginning to learn and of healing other people through prayer. And those nine years culminated in the publication, then, of the very first edition of Science and Health in 1875. Well, today, some 11 million copies later, in 17 different languages, 
This book continues to present to the world the living, active science behind Christ Jesus' healing and teaching ministry. Discusses his healing methods and their outcomes. And she presents them as the full and clear explanation of divine law. She further describes this law as divine love. And love as being the foundational, reliable, and effective truth of goodness at work in our lives today, here and now. She wrote in Science and Health about this divine love and what it does. She said, divine love always has met and always will meet every human need. Again, no disclaimer there doesn't say we'll meet every human need except the really big ones or yours or mine. Every human need, no exceptions. She says it is not well to imagine that Jesus demonstrated the divine power to heal only for a select number or for a limited period of time since to all mankind and in every hour divine love supplies all good in every hour, in this hour. Powerful assurance of spiritual healing, isn't it? And yet, you know, if you or someone you know is in pain or sick, maybe they've just lost their job or maybe they've lost their home, you may be thinking, really? Divine love supplying all good it doesn't feel like that right now. And you may ask again, how could Mary Baker Eddy make such a statement? Well, the reasons are many, and let me just give you a couple. One is that this lasting, comforting idea of God's love was something that she had found over and over again in the Bible, including Jesus' own promise in John's Gospel, chapter 14, and this is from the King James Bible. That if we love Christ and follow his words, then my Father will love him. And we will come to, unto him and make our abode with him. God and his Christ are moving in. And then he says, and as you listen to the words, feel that sense of divine love almost as a mother might share with a child, tucking that child in at night. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Another reason that Mary Baker Eddy could point to this loving presence of Christ with such certainty was that just a year or two after her own complete recovery from the life-threatening effects of this fall, she was healing others, if not on a daily basis, certainly on a consistent basis. Healing them through prayer alone, proving conclusively to the world that divine love is the enduring law behind Christian healing and that it brings reliable, definitive results time after time. It's not miraculous in the sense of some extraordinary reversal of human adversity by God's mystical intervention. And this is a key point. Christian science explains the presence of divine love meeting every human need, meeting your needs, as a divinely natural fact, a fact that you and I can experience every day as the fulfillment of spiritual law. Natural fact, unchangeable law. That's true with our little paperweight here. We could do this all night long and the outcome would be the same. That's not miraculous. That is the law of gravity at work. And when God heals you and then keeps you well, 
That's not miraculous. That's not mystical. That's God's law of love lifting your faith above hope to the level of spiritual understanding. Well, this brings us to our second foundation stone that Jesus gave, that of prayer. So let's think this one through together. When you hear people today talking about prayer, how are they describing it? What words are they using? Desire. Prayer is desire. Now I'm going to pause here because I want to make sure what you mean by desire. It's not the desire for the, the BMW, is it? <laughs> And the reason I ask that is that there are some practices out there, there are some folks who are saying if you can visualize the thing, you'll have it. What is the desire in prayer that we're really seeking? Spiritual understanding. Not unrelated at all to our concept of faith. So a desire for spiritual understanding. Okay, what else is prayer? Listen. Prayer is listening. Yes, it is. What else? Prayer is finding a sense of peace. What else? Talking with God. So we have listening and talking. Absolutely right. Any others? Acknowledging. Acknowledging, sure. Abbreviate that. Acknowledging. What else? Prayer is having a sense of humility. Bowing, if you will, mentally before that higher power, that divine source. Any others? Gratitude. gratitude. The prayer of gratitude, absolutely. Okay, these are excellent. And I, and I like the fact that both listening and talking came out because, as a friend of mine once pointed out to me, you have two ears and one mouth. Use them in proportion. And so when we pray, we, we need to spend a lot less time trying to tell God what we think he needs to know. We need to spend twice as much time at least listening to what God is telling us is already true. Let me share with you an experience in our own family. This was a number of years ago, but it illustrates the, the immediate and effective result of prayer. And this was a prayer that lifted our younger daughter out of a serious illness. She was about two years old, and she had developed a very high fever. <clears throat> she was becoming listless, she had stopped eating and drinking. Now, both my wife and I, as young parents, had seen the power of prayer heal this child, ourselves, and our older daughter a number of times already. So it was just natural for us to turn to God in prayer in this hour of need. But it seemed this time that we just could not stop focusing on the symptoms and we started to become very afraid of what those symptoms were showing us. Seemed to be going from bad to worse. And so we phoned a Christian science practitioner to pray with us, to pray for us. A Christian science practitioner is someone who gives their full time on a professional basis to helping others find healing and answers through prayer. You don't have to be a member of the Christian Science Church to call a practitioner. And if you want to find a practitioner, there's a couple of different ways that we can do this. There's a very easy website for you to remember. It's called christianscience.com. And if you go there, you will find a, a link that will take you to a worldwide directory of Christian Science healers, of practitioners. You can also find a worldwide directory in print in the monthly magazine called the Christian Science Journal. And if you want to pick up a copy of the journal, there are two reading rooms here in this area. The one is on First Street in Beaverton. The other is on Main Street in Hillsboro. And again, our 
folks who are manning the table tonight have copies of these cards available, pick one up. Take it with you. So this practitioner, who actually lived in the same town where we were, came to our home. She prayed with us. She prayed for us. And yet, nothing changed. Well, my wife and I knew that we needed to make an immediate decision for the good of our daughter, for the health and life of our daughter. Either we were going to turn her over wholeheartedly to her father, mother God's infinite loving care, or we were going to take her to the hospital emergency room because we simply would not and could not allow this illness to continue. We certainly were not about to lose this child. And now let me just add also, <clears throat> because it, there is some very specific context here in your state of Oregon. In Wisconsin, where we lived at the time, we knew that our state laws did accommodate the freedom to choose the best treatment available for our daughter. But that also meant putting her health and her well-being above all other concerns. In other words, with the freedom of choice came the undeniable responsibility to choose wisely, and in our case, to choose quickly. And as we were facing this decision point of what we were going to do, my wife turned to the 91st Psalm in the King James Bible, and she read these three verses aloud. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Well, my wife and I felt that this was the tangible presence of Christ speaking directly to us, reminding us that our daughter's life was held in God's loving hands. Sometime later, my wife told me that at that moment when she read from Psalm 91, she was certain that all was well. And indeed, from that point going forward, our fear and our worry began to give way tangibly to confidence and trust. We were turning to God with that desire for a greater spiritual understanding, gratitude for his love and goodness, in humility acknowledging his all presence, listening for what he was telling us. Well, within an hour or two of this, our daughter sat up. She ate and drank a little. The fever broke quickly and completely. In fact, by that evening, she had not only eaten a normal dinner, she had bossed her big sister around for a while. <laughs> she slept through the night. We checked in on her a number of times. We certainly were not about to just go away and leave her. We checked in on her many times that evening. She slept soundly through the night. She got up the next morning, and it was so completely evident that she wasn't just better. She was entirely well. We never had to make that trip to the hospital emergency room, although we were willing to do so if needed. But we discovered in this experience that we had a rather unique 911. You know what that was? Psalm 91, verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And so for us, that whole picture of a life-threatening illness gave way to a deeply spiritual and foundational change in viewpoint. And that same transforming change is possible for each one of you each time you pray. No disclaimers, no exceptions. You know, as I travel and share this message with people around the country, they'll sometimes ask me, how did Jesus pray? How can I pray? How do I know my prayers are going to be answered? Well, in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he told us how we need to pray in private, 
one-on-one -on -one with God, away from the world's noise and clamor. And then he gave us what to pray. The most powerful prayer that the world has ever known and will ever need. The Lord's Prayer. That amazing prayer which begins, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. In Science and Health, Mary Baker Eddy calls the Lord's Prayer the prayer that covers all human needs. Now, recall our discussion from a little bit ago of her dis describing how divine love always has met, always will meet every human need. And now we have the prayer which covers all human needs. May we not think of the Lord's Prayer as the prayer of divine love? love? I think we can. And in fact, she adds here on the same page, as we pray quietly as Jesus taught, we rise above every downward pull of mortality, and then we reach the heaven-born aspiration and spiritual consciousness which is indicated in the Lord's Prayer and which instantaneously heals the sick. And so, my friends, whenever prayer helps you to feel divine love's goodness and grace in your life, it's because of the Christ, this tangible divine idea or expression of God speaking to you, touching your thought, touching your heart with that ever-present peace that I leave with you, my peace that I give unto you. And this comforting divine evidence of God's presence shows you that your spiritual identity and being are at one with God. And in fact, through the Christ, Jesus has presented to the world an enduring reality, one that applies to each one of us. If you like to think of it as a reliable and lasting rule, that rule is the perfect, healthy, spiritual identity of you and me and everyone as God's children. And speaking of this enduring, lasting, effective truth that heals, Mary Baker Eddy explains it this way. She says, it is this Christ which enables you to demonstrate with scientific certainty, the rule of healing, based upon its divine principle, love, underlying, overlying, and encompassing all true being. A woman that I know, a very good friend of mine, brought this rule of healing into her own life about five or six years ago. She asked me to give her Christian science treatment through prayer because she had discovered a lump in one of her breasts. Now she told me that she had been praying to recognize herself as wholly spiritual, unmarked by imperfection, but she was really struggling with the fear that this lump was becoming malignant. Now she also told me another thing. She said she really resented the limitations of the very small rural town where she and her husband were living. They were living rather close to her parents pretty much at her parents' insistence. She said she'd been feeling as if she was dying inside because of this hard and fairly bleak lifestyle with almost no opportunities for her or her husband combined with this almost daily pressure from her parents, please don't ever move away. Well, one night, as she was praying and thinking, she turned to one of Mary Baker Eddy's poems a poem which reads in part, Thou wilt bind the stubborn will, wound the callous breast, make self-righteousness be still, break earth's stupid rest. Well, it wasn't the line about the callous breast or the stubborn will that 
got her attention. It was about breaking Earth's stupid rest that really got her thinking. She turned to the glossary in Science and Health, a chapter that gives spiritual definitions to biblical terms. And she found part of the definition of Earth in the glossary referring to this, that to material sense, Earth is matter. And so for her then, breaking Earth's stupid rest really meant for her awakening from the dim and dull belief that she didn't have the ability to perceive new and spiritually clear ideas. Prayer awakened her to see the spiritually good and spiritually pure qualities that were hers all along, but that she hadn't noticed for a while. Qualities like purity, grace, symmetry. She began letting the lens of spirit really enlarge for her her view of her true identity and her true worth. And one evening, she said, it was as if an angel had spoken to her, such a clear message that came to her as she was struggling with pain and doubt and fear. She said, It was the first time I'm certain I actually heard a message. It said, you already know what you need to know. You are healed. Well, as she was describing this to me, she said, immediately after that, I fell peacefully asleep. She said, several hours later, I woke up. And she said, before I even noticed that there had been some physical change, I knew that healing had come. And this is an important point. She knew that healing had occurred even before she noticed any physical change. Well, a few minutes later, she did, in fact, discover that the lump had completely disappeared. Well, in talking with my friend not long ago about her healing, she said, Tell your audience this. She said, tell them how I've gained a much better sense of who I am spiritually. She said, I'd always known that. She said, but I just wasn't seeing how significant and practical this idea was. How important it was to acknowledge myself, to listen with humility and gratitude to what God was telling me about myself. Well, as I said, that was about five or six years ago. The healing is permanent, and in fact, yes, she and her husband have moved to a much larger city with many more opportunities for them both, which they're enjoying, and have made the move with her parents' blessing. What happened here? Christian science gave her, just as it can give you, the assurance and the certainty to challenge and to heal every illness, every fear, every destructive thought or evil act that confronts you. You won't wonder. You won't doubt. You will know. Well, this brings us to our third and final foundation stone that Jesus gave us for healing, that of fasting. So, Audience participation time, again. Fasting, as you hear it described or as you think about it, how do you describe it? Discipline. Discipline. Excellent description. What else? Giving up limits. Okay. It almost seems counterintuitive. Fasting seems like a limitation. But we're saying we're giving up limits. It's good. What else? Cleansing. Cleansing. Okay. And what was the other one kind of from over here? Turning away. Let's, let's simplify that a little bit. Turn away from physicality. Okay, got room for a couple more yet? Being steadfast, sure. All right. 
I'm going to abbreviate that just in the interest of time. Steadfast, S apostrophe fast. We got room probably for one more. Fasting is obedience, sure. Now, there's something in common with all of these. These are things, these are qualities that we can express, things that we can do. Is there one concept that these all lead to? If we are disciplined, if we give up limitation, if we practice that sense of spiritual and if we want even a sense of physical cleansing, turning away from physicality, what does all of this lead us to? One word. The, someone say purification? does. It leads us to purity. And I like to get that in here because in describing to his disciples this concept of fasting, the Greek word that Jesus uses here is nestia, and it refers specifically to the Jews' day of atonement. The Interpreter's Bible Dictionary describes this fasting day as a moment when the covenant relationship between God and his people is pure and God's intervention is anticipated. So what Jesus is doing here is connecting the mental and spiritual purity that's associated with fasting to the ability to understand more of God's promised relationship with his children as they celebrate their atonement. Now, science and health puts an interesting spiritual perspective on this word, atonement. Mary Baker Eddy shows how it refers to, indeed, the complete unity of God and us in our true spiritual identity. But then in science and health, she expands the word this way. She says, if truth is overcoming error in your daily walk and conversation, to me implying the idea of fasting, you can finally say, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith because you are better for it. And then she says, this is having part in the at one -ment with truth and love. The at one -ment with truth and love. Being at one, having that sense of unity and purity with that divine love that meets every human need. Mrs. Eddy once wrote also that merely to abstain from eating, you know, as, as disciplined and as right and as good as that is, <clears throat> she said merely to abstain from eating is not sufficient to meet the demand for healing. She says what is needed is to silence appetites, passion, and all that wars against spirit and spiritual power. In other words, what we need to do is to dump human will and our own personal agendas and desires. And we need to replace these with the pure spirituality that is the basis of all true thought and action and of making intelligent choices. And I learned this a number of years ago when I was part of a development team putting together an international business conference for a couple of hundred people coming literally from all around the world. The nature of the work that we were doing demanded a great deal from us. We were really sailing in uncharted waters. We, our organization had never had a conference like this. And so the content that we were developing for three days with these men and women coming to see us was unprecedented. And so we were charged with not only demonstrating a great sense of unity and team effort, but also individual creativity and spontaneity. We worked in teams. I was one of several team leaders. And there was incredible deadline pressure to meet certain benchmarks before we could move on. This deadline pressure kept getting more and more intense. And as the deadlines grew shorter, 
guess what else grew short? Patience, tempers, all that goodwill, all that unity. A lot of it went out the window. And I found myself, as did others in our group, really needing to think through and to have a, a much greater sense of mutual respect for each other. It wasn't easy. And what I was doing was shoveling in all kinds of negative thoughts, frustration, the flood of human opinions. I just kind of opened up and let it all in. <laughs> but the more I took in, the less satisfied I became, not only with the project, but with my own performance. Well, we did manage to pull it together. I was getting up earlier each morning to just prepare myself in prayer for that day. The very first morning of the conference, before I ever left the house, something completely unexpected happened to me. I was leaning over to tie my shoe, and as I did so, an incredibly sharp pain went through my lower back, so much so that it took me a minute or two just to be able to stand upright again. Well, I made it to the conference, ached my way through the morning. <laughs> The pain kept getting worse and worse, and by lunchtime, I knew I simply had to leave and to go home. And I called a Christian science practitioner and teacher to pray with me, to pray for me. His spiritual treatment, his prayer, helped me almost at once to start to glimpse some things I hadn't really realized were going on. One of these was to realize that I had never lost my uprightness as God's child. He helped me to regain a sense of confidence and worthiness. He also helped me to begin some fasting, <laughs> specifically to silence all of the negativity, all of that flood of human opinions and worry and personal responsibility that I had shoveled in and that all was now crushing me down. And as I continued to pray, to pray more deeply than I had ever done before, I gradually began to understand some things. I had to silence the self-will that I realized had been at war with God's will for quite some time. Because after all, as one of the team leaders, nobody had a better concept of it than I did. Nobody's team was as good as mine. I had to let all that go. And instead, I had to let God's perfect law of good, of God's control, of his purity, I had to let that stand front and center. And I also needed to accept the fact that the power of God's love and of his spiritual grace these don't govern just meetings. They govern lives. My worry, my self-will, self-justification began to fade away, began to drop away. And I began to understand my covenant relationship with God, my at one with God much more clearly. By the end of the following week, I went back to work completely healed. Up until that point, I had been using a walker and a cane just to move around. The day I walked back into the office without either one of those was a day of great joy. And I should mention, by the way, that that conference, that went off just fine, thank you very much, <laughs> even though I wasn't there. Well, today the lessons of this experience continue to really shape my life. They continue to shape my public practice of Christian science healing. And this experience has made me think about really kind of a two-part question. The first part is, how did this healing come about with such reliable effectiveness? And is this something that's repeatable? Well, the answer, as we've seen tonight, has to be an emphatic Yes, it is repeatable. It is going on each day. And it comes about with reliable effectiveness because the law of divine love is universal. It is impartial. It is certain. And it applies 
unconditionally to each one of us. It applies to you and you and you. It applies to you and you and you and you. No exceptions. Every conceivable phase of your lives. Now, last question, no flip chart. Does the conviction of this profoundly spiritual view of God's law of love, does that conviction come just like that? What do you think? Some heads are going this way. <laughs> the best answer that I have found is that it can. It can come just like this, and we celebrate those times. We give that prayer of deep gratitude to God for those times when that insight comes so quickly. More often, at least for me, that realization of the truth grows day by day. And for each one of us, I think we'll find it also does the same. It grows day by day as our spiritual perception broadens and deepens through faith, through prayer, and through fasting. And in proportion then to our individual spiritual progress, we come to see ourselves as God has seen us, as God has made us, wholly perfect and perfectly whole, completely spiritual and spiritually complete. You see, divine love is not only the most reliable and effective means and effective source of caring for our health, divine love is the only law at work in the lives of everyone, everywhere around the world. In fact, in the entire universe. And so Christian science then gives you the faith, the prayer, and the purity of spiritual fasting to follow Christ Jesus' example allows you to heal and to be healed effectively with certainty today. And you will be fulfilling God's reliable law of divine love with absolute certainty. And for that, I thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you.